Hello and welcome. My name is James Vincent, one of the product line managers at IBM I2, and it is my pleasure to introduce I2's National Security and Defense Intelligence Solution. In this session, I will introduce the National Security and Defense Intelligence Solution, and we'll also take a deeper dive into its capabilities through a product demonstration. I2 has always been uniquely positioned to address the growing and evolving challenges of the national security and defense sector. For the last 25 years, I2 has provided solutions that have enabled smarter decisions not only in this space, but also across law enforcement, government, and the private sector, increasing efficiencies in thwarting terrorist, criminal, and fraudulent activities. Recognizing some of the challenges that were presenting themselves in the national security and defense sector, IBM I2 decided that rather than having a generic set of capabilities, a more focused approach was required to address the pain points of both the market and the users. For instance, the change in stance from contingency operations from campaigns, the greater drive for sharing intelligence across coalition forces and partner agencies, and to deliver greater effectiveness on reduced budgets presents a very unique challenge not faced in all of our segments. In addition, there are common trends across the intelligence space that needed to be addressed. Let's take the case of big data. The challenge has been to derive insights from overwhelming data, volume, and format. This is not something any individual can solve manually, but our approach being able to fuse data into a single analysis ready, ready, ready information layer, an analytics layer that can be used to inject system-led analytics to reduce repetitive tasks that could be automated, and finally a rich visual analysis layer enabling key intelligence stakeholders to explore and exploit the information to discover what is known and unknown for faster, more informed decision-making enables these challenges to be technically addressed. In support of the technical and sector challenges, IBM I2 National Security and Defense Solution was based on three core pillars. We decided it must be part of an interoperable intelligence information system that can leverage the value of an existing infrastructure and investment, produce consumable, accurate, and in actionable intelligence products that lead to informed decision making, and of course be able to execute across a variety of missions and environments from headquarters to beyond the wire. NDI provides three primary benefits. Firstly, scalability. Scalability in terms of users, data, and operational environment. Secondly, it is modular. Its modular design allows its core multidimensional analysis capabilities to be extended and supplemented by other analytics that may be specific to task or equally removed depending on the nature of operation. And lastly, its interoperability. From a technical standpoint, it is written against open standards allowing it to be incorporated into an existing operational environment. But also from a skill set standpoint, it is able to bring operational discipline, disciplines together and so it can be act, act as a force multiplier. With respect to packaging, IBM I2 also recognizes that there are a number of different roles which need slightly different sets of needs being addressed. NDI standard is a rich multidimensional analysis environment designed primarily for the analysts for intelligence production tasks, whereas NDI field delivers a subset of core capabilities to a wider community, such as forward deployed collection teams, providing lighter capabilities for data entry and discovery. So with that, we're going to move across into the demonstration. And for this, we're going to focus on the National Security and Defense Intelligence Solution, the standard component. So this is the one that is designed for analysts. So to put a bit of context to this demonstration, as I move across into uh, the demonstration environment. I'm going to take the stance of being a, an analyst within an, an I-Star unit, and we've received this request for information. It is my job, by using the, the NDI standard, to find out information about Ali al-Shabaab and his key associates, information assessment of potential placements for Ali al-Shabaab, intelligence on his pattern of life, and also previous insurgent incidents along likely avenues of approach. So the first thing that I do is I open the NDI standard window. So behind this, I have a collaborative environment and analysis repository. So I first search for a, a, a person's name, Ali Al-Shabaab. This full text and uh, system allows me to search for both um, exact and fuzzy matching. It also searches across anything that is within a collaborative environment. And in this case, it's brought across a number of different items, being charts, documents, and persons that match my search term and is highlighted for context. 
drilling into the person, I can quickly identify my, the person that I'm looking for, Ali Al-Shabaab, and I'm shown some additional information so I know that this is the person that I'm after. Of course, I need to identify um, key associates. So I have a saved um, query that I can run against, which looks for common neighbors. In this instance, it is a person linked to two others, and they must have a link between them as well. So I just put the conditions on to say the person's first name in this instance, and also to give the surname. This will then look over those properties and give some more context into um, what it is that I'm looking for. And this will again look across the entirety of the collaborative analysis repository. So upon searching, I get my results back, again, which is a faceted view showing me some entities, some people entities, and also the association links that are built between them. So what I would do is I'll add this to our visualization area, the chart in this instance, and that will allow me just to put the entities and the links in a little bit more context. I'll move these around just so I can see the information. So it looks like you've got Al-Shabaab, his wife, and also their child. But I need, this, I need some greater context. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a series of expands to uh, a level of about six deep. Um, normally, um, for this demonstration, I'll do this rather quickly. But normally, I could expand out a level at a time and then assess the uh, connections and then also the interconnectivity that starts to be presented from the information that is available in my uh, collaborative environment. So there is also, once I've finished expanding, there is also a number of analytical layers that can be applied to see if I can actually make sense of this network visually, first of all, because there's a lot, that, a lot of insight that can be drawn from visually looking at um, some information. So from running this layer, I can clearly see that there are a number of key individuals that seem to be gatekeepers of information or critical to this, to this uh, small network that's been built up around Ali al-Shabaab. Of course, what I've been asked to look for is emerging leaders. So I will use a technique called social network analysis. And if I use a combination of a centrality measure called between us that allows me to identify gatekeepers, and also eigenvectors, which are hubs of authority, these two combined will give me an indication, a numeric indication, of uh, emerging leaders within the network. So I can see that, very quickly, Sultan Abu Ruwash is the most likely candidate to be uh, the emerging leader. But what I will do is select the top five, because they will probably all need to be analyzed in their, on their own merits. And I will add these to a set. By adding these to a set in my collaborative environment, it just means that I'm able to share the information that I have found to the wider community. And it may be a collection or collation team that maybe need to add some more context. So first of all, I will search for a set to see if there has already been one created called um, Emerging Players. If not, I can create one. So again, I give it, the, uh, give it, the, give it a name, something that's identifiable um, amongst the community of users. And so at any point that I go and search for uh, um, a Ruwash or any member that is within the, um, the Ali Al-Shabaab network, then I can get that information back. So what I will do is I will start to build up a profile of uh, Ruwash that was the top member of my list. So again, I will search the collaborative environment to see what is known. And the person comes back, that's not a surprise because he came back while I was working. But I also have a chart that has come back. Um, I'm going to take a look at that chart um, because, again, it shows some association information that's come from human intelligence. I can see that it was actually shared by a coalition force. Charts are often shared um, at the mechanism of sharing data because they can be redacted and the data within them can be controlled very, very, uh, very easily. And, of course, through the sharing of charts, Whilst this information at this time is locked within the chart, I can use tools such as um, uploading these selected items 
to make them primary um, within, within my repository or within the shared repository. So I select the items, I choose to upload them. As this has come from a, a different unit, the modeling may be slightly different. So the first step that I must do is align the items that are in solely within this chart to, um, to the items or to the fields that I wish to have them, that information saved within the uh, repository. So this is a simple process. I select a group of, of items, in this case, per piece person, and I ask their full name to go into the also known as. Then I have a choice. I don't necessarily have to take all of that information. These documents are in my repository anyway, so they're indexed. There is no need to uh, upload them again, um, so I will choose to deselect those. Everything is ready to go into the repository, so just some final tasks. The first task being that I want to do some duplicate detection, so I'll choose to do so on name. And then again, as I did before, I would like the uploaded items to go into a specific set so that they are um, so they are combined together, and I will call that Ruosh Associate. There's no need to upload the chart because I have that saved in the repository. That's where I got it from the first time. Again, saving space and also avoiding any duplication. And once this set of information is uploaded, because this is probably the most likely person to, uh, to be the emerging leader, then I will open up that set that has just been created, and I will also place an alert. Now, alerts on sets can um, have a number of different settings. Of course, when the set itself changes, or whenever, whenever any item within that set is altered or anything is added or removed from that set. So that will give me alert, an alert if anything does change um, within, that, um, within that set. The next step, of course, is having a look at, uh, the next thing on the RFI was to have a look at the pattern of life. So what I've decided to do is I have Ali Al Shabab's telephone number. So all of our communications isn't actually held within our repository at this time. It is stored in three different repositories within the location. So I'm going to do a federated search across those three um, infrastructures that I have, and I'm going to use a search mechanism that is specified for telephone number. So we'll search those three sources, and depending on what um, results that I get, I will retrieve, um, receive a, an alert. I'm sorry a score based on the information that is stored within those three repositories. And in this instance, that telephone number has a score of 10, so an exact match across all of those three different data sources. So of course, what I'm going to do now is do an expand. So what this expand will do is it will show me any commonality or otherwise hidden connections that may lie between those three data sources. So then that information comes back. Again, it shows me all of that information. I will add it to my visualization, using the charting surface this time as a vetting area. I haven't brought it into my repository at this time. I'm just doing the questioning and the um, exploration and exploitation. So visually, when this information comes back, as you can imagine, there is a huge amount or a huge volume of um, telephone calls, each with their own specific date and time. So there isn't really much visually that this chart is offering me, but I'm going to go across to our filters and histograms, and then I can start drilling into that information. So again, just to recap, I'm looking at patterns of life. So one of the things that I could get from uh, communications is potential bed down times. So by looking at the date and the time that is on the link, the first thing I'll do is have a look at the, uh, the day of week to see if there is any periods of inactivity or, or bed down time um, for this person's usage of phone. Now I can see that there is no um, quiet time, but there is a kind of a reduced activity on a Tuesday. So I'm going to go more granular this time. I'm going to ask for hour of day. So by overlaying hour of day, then what I can see is anything from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. from Sunday to Thursday shows it consistently a period of inactivity. This is valuable information when looking for pattern of life. Then the final part of this RFI was to have a look at um, insurgent activity 
around Ali Al Shabab's home address and like, like likely um, approach um, vectors. So I do have a chart on previous um, analysis techniques. I do have a chart that I've worked on previously that does connect, does contain not only the home address of Ali Al Shabab but also our home base as well. So through our connector to Esri, I can start to perform some geospatial questioning. So I can start asking the where type of questions. So I will select the, uh, the two locations, Ali Al Shabab's home and also the home base, and I will send them across to our Esri instance. So the next thing that I will need to do is to plot a likely route. So through, through using a polyline, I can track the most the, the common approach from the home base through to Ali Al Shabab's location. Now we don't necessarily have to be too precise, but I will follow the uh, the main trunk road that lies between the two areas. And so because this isn't a, uh, a precise line, what it will now do is I will add a, a, a buffer around that area, a buffer of, of 500 meters to show kind of um, my, rough, my rough drawing, just to give that the, uh, an area of, um, of fuzziness. Because the next thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to ask that polyline of any activities that have happened around our, our our approach vector. So this can be done by querying a feature layer within Esri, and I do have a feature layer that looks at um, Afghanistan's significant activities, and within there I can drill down and choose the enemy activity. That will then get plotted onto our mapping area. And rather than changing the picture of this chart that I have for the Al Masini network activities, I will open a new chart and add that information as a visual representation. And again, I can do this through a single click that sends the features across. So the map has served its purpose, so I'll move that across to, uh, to one side. And I'll rearrange the chart just so that things aren't in a straight line and actually are able to be seen on, a, uh, on, on just a single view. So from the information that was sent over from the, the feature layer, I'm now going to use the filters and histograms to see what information lies beneath, beneath the skin. And there are a number of different fields that I can make use of. The first thing that I, I'm going to choose is look at the names. And I can see that there is an IED explosion is one of the titles. And so that ni nicely groups, um, groups that amount of activity together for me. Now this is something on a route to approach, but this might be something that, uh, that we need to look at in a bit more detail. So each one of these highlighted pieces of information, again, has a number of pieces of intelligence behind behind the surface, one of those being date and time, something that I can use uh, to my advantage. So I'm going to open up what is known as the activity view. The activity view allows me to take a more granular look at the date and time that is in. And it, from what I can see, it shows me not only overlaps or um, items happening one after the other, but as I move down, I can actually see periods, so between the end of August to the beginning of October and mid-November to the beginning of January, a periods of activity, a period of inactivity where the rest is, um, is very active. So that could be valuable, and I'm certainly going to make um, use of that.
that comes uh, draws a close to our um, demonstration. But to show you what is in, uh, sorry, NDI field, which is the pieces that are offered in the um, web, then we have our normal searching that is available um, through, through a browser. We also have a visualization capability, which again is able to show um, interconnectivity between um, items of interest. We have that ability to do that structured query, that visual query, drawing a picture of the question that we're trying to ask. And also, we have our alerts as well. So again, even those people that are using the thin client have access to the alerts. And just to show, um, again, there is no difference between the two, between the two portals. I'll do a quick search for Ruash. And again, the same set of results come back that we were looking at when I was in um, the Analyst Notebook Standard. Uh, sorry, the uh, National Security and Defense Intelligence Standard, the one that is driven through the Analyst Notebook Premium front end as a rich client. And again, there is a set that we uploaded. So sharing of information between the analysts and the rest of the community can all be driven through these sets, which all have alerts on. So I'll just go back now into uh, the presentation just to, uh, just to finalize this, this session. So to summarize, hopefully what I've shown you over this last 30 minutes is that NDI is scalable. It scales to meet a variety of mission needs and environments, supporting a single user all the way to the enterprise. NDI is modular. It is enhanced with additional add-ons to meet specific needs. NDI is interoperable and it integrates with existing infrastructure and leverages existing IBM and also third-party investments. And finally, NDI is cost-effective, delivering a common set of tools as well as extensibility and flexibility across the enterprise. NDI reduces also training, maintenance, and deployment costs. Should you have any further questions, please visit IBM.com or approach your IBM representative. Thank you very much.